you know what? It just occurred to me that I'm 40 plus videos in and I still haven't done a beginner video for Clip Studio Paint. My name's Sarah, and this tutorial will be an overview about how to get started in this versatile art program. As an example, I'll show you how to make a square social media icon like this. If you don't yet have CSP, head to their website for a free trial. Now let's get started. When you first install CSP and double-click the icon, you'll get to this window, which is simply called Clip Studio. To actually get to Clip Studio Paint, click on Draw. You're met with a lot of panels and a big blank space in the middle. If you're used to other art programs, some of this probably already looks familiar. But if you're brand new, don't get intimidated. There's a good rule to go by with any art program, well, any program really, is the 80-20 rule. 80% of the time, you're only going to use about 20% of the tools a program has available. And once you get the hang of CSP, it's pretty easy. The first thing you need is a canvas upon which to draw. Go to File, and select New. There are several project types, but the simplest is this very first one, Illustration. Choose the width and height you want for your canvas. Right now, I'm working in pixels, as you can see by the unit PX in the corner here. If you're looking to print your work, you might want to switch the unit to a measurement like inches, centimeters, or millimeters. Work that's digital only is usually a resolution of 72 dpi, while print is most commonly 300 dpi. I'll save talking about image resolutions for a future video. Let me know if that's something you want to see. In the meantime, I did make a text tutorial on the subject a while ago. Link in the description. For this example, let's say you want to draw yourself a square social media profile picture. Working in pixels with a resolution of 72 dpi is fine. But what size do you choose? Well, bigger is generally better, but why? Here's a 200 pixel by 200 pixel canvas, and here's a 2048 by 2048. They kind of look the same at first, but when you draw on each one and zoom in, you quickly see the difference. The more pixels, the sharper and more detailed the image you can create. You can always save your final image smaller than your working file, but it's really hard to save it bigger without it looking like a pixelated mess. That said, there is such a thing as too big. A canvas 10,000 pixels or more across can cause your computer to run really slow, especially for a complex image or an older machine. I usually start with a baseline around 3,600 pixels, but sometimes I'll go bigger or smaller depending on the project. You'll get the hang of what works for you over time. So let's set our width and height to 3,600 pixels each. The paper option is your background color. You can change it, or turn it off, but I like to start with white. You can give your illustration a name here, but you don't have to. I'll leave it as is so I can show you how to change it later. Go ahead and hit OK. Now we've got a big empty square canvas. Up here in the corner is the name of the canvas, which I left as Illustration. The first thing you might want to do is save this canvas. Go to File, Save As. Choose a location on your hard drive to save your canvas. Notice that it's in the Clip Studio format, which has a file extension of .clip. Give the file a name, then click Save. In the corner, it's now changed to my new name, Social Media Icon. When you make changes to your canvas, you can now go to File, Save at any time to be sure they're saved for future use. The shortcut for this is Control s Many artists, myself included, just get in the habit of hitting Control s regularly so we don't lose our work. The canvas is currently docked in the center of the screen, but you can click and drag here to put it in a separate window you can move around. Hover at the corner until you see this icon, then click and drag to make the window bigger or smaller. If you prefer it docked, just click and drag the canvas name until you see it turn red like this, and it'll snap back to the center when you release the mouse button. To the left and right of your canvas are several panels, which in Clip Studio Paint are called palettes. 
Your setup may look a little different from mine, but this is pretty much the default layout. Over here, you have a list of all of your main tools. Tools for drawing, selecting, erasing, and lots more. If you hover over a tool, you can see its name and get a hint as to what it does. Clicking a tool will bring up a list of its subtools, sometimes only one, and sometimes a lot. In fact, some tools have so many that they're divided again into categories at the top, which are called subtool groups. You can even make your own tools subtools and groups, but that's a subject for a more advanced video. Be aware that choosing a subtool also changes the icon of the main tool. This is why your tool icons might look different than mine. The most common settings for your selected subtool are found in the Tool Property palette here. You can find additional settings by clicking the wrench icon, but mostly what you need will be here. While most tools that use a brush allow you to change the size and the properties, you can also directly select a brush size just underneath here. Finally, at the bottom, you can pick a color. Choose a color on the outer wheel. In the inner box, clicking and dragging up and down affects the brightness of the color, while side to side affects saturation. If you're all the way to the left, it'll only be black, gray, or white. But anywhere else, you'll see the color you picked. Now that we've selected a tool, how does it work? In Clip Studio Paint, you'll create your art using one or more layers. Most digital art programs work in layers, which you can see over here on the Layer Palette. If you don't see the Layer Palette, click Window, Layer. You'll always start with an empty Layer 1. Because I had the Paper option turned on when I created the canvas, you can see it here too. My canvas looks white, but if I hide the paper layer by clicking this eyeball icon, it now looks like a gray checkerboard instead. This checkerboard is actually just an indicator of transparency, and you'll see this in pretty much all art programs. The tool I've got selected is under the Pen tool, called the G-Pen Subtool. It's great for drawing simple, ink-like lines. If you're using a mouse, hover over the canvas, click the left mouse button, hold it, and drag. Let go to finish the line. If you're using a tablet, press down and drag to draw instead, lifting your pen or finger when you're done. Notice how the drawing is affected by both the brush size and color we chose. If I change the size and color and draw again, the new settings are used. But that's just one layer. To add a second layer, click this button that says New Raster Layer. It's automatically named Layer 2. You can rename a layer by double-clicking on the name, typing in your new name, and clicking the Enter key on your keyboard. Naming your layers is a really good habit to get into, and you'll thank me when you're on layer 47 or so. I'll switch my color again and draw something on this new layer. Everything on this layer appears on top because this layer is above my original one. However, I can change their order by left-clicking and holding on this new layer. You'll see a ghost version of the layer attach itself to your cursor. Drag it down until you see a red line appear under the other layer. Release the mouse button and the layer will be dropped to this new position. Now the drawing we did on the second layer appears behind the first one. You can also turn each layer on and off independently using the eyeball icon. Layers can also be see-through. If I select the topmost layer and drop its opacity by clicking here, you can now partially see the lower layer through it. Note how you can now see that faint checkerboard through it too, indicating that even though there's nothing on the layer behind it, it's still partially see-through. Even if I set the layer back to 100% opacity, certain tools can be see-through too. You can change the opacity of any brush. It will then be see-through when you draw on the layer with it. Certain tools are also naturally translucent. For example, go to the Airbrush tool, 
and choose the Soft Subtool. Painting with this tool always has some feathered opacity around the edges. Layers also have something called a blending mode. I'm not going to dive too deep into these today, but they're useful to know about. The basic blending mode, Normal, means the layer on top covers the ones underneath. The other modes allow the layer to mix its color, brightness, and saturation with the ones below it in all kinds of ways. Here's a practical example with one of my illustrations on the lower layer, and a colorful vignette on top. By changing the blending mode of the top layer to Multiply, its color and brightness give the lower layer a totally new look. Now, before I go any further, it would help to have a drawing to look at. There we go. I drew this line art on a layer by itself. When I turn off the paper layer, you can see the background is transparent. If you'd like to follow along for the rest of the tutorial, you can download the .clip file of my Griffin drawing from the link below. To open it, go to File, Open. Navigate to where you saved the .clip file, and select it. Incidentally, this is how you can open any kind of image file that Clip Studio Paint supports. Click Open. There are a number of ways you can change your view of the canvas while working on your art. Up here is the Navigator palette. If you don't see it, go to Window, and select Navigator. Some of these options are also down at the bottom of your canvas. For example, zoom using this slider, or the plus and minus buttons. This button zooms to 100%, which is often quite big. This one zooms your canvas to fit to the screen instead. You can rotate the canvas with this slider, or these buttons, just like turning a piece of paper to make it easier to draw something. Reset the rotation with this button. Finally, you can flip the canvas with these buttons, horizontal with this one, and vertical with this one. Be aware that when you navigate the canvas, you aren't changing the image itself, just your view of it. Let's export the image, and I'll show you what I mean. This is how my actual image looks, but I'm going to flip it, and rotate it, using the navigator. You don't need to do this, it's just a demonstration. Go to File, and hover on Export Single Layer. A quick note, this is kind of a misnomer. It really should say Export Single Image, since you're exporting all visible layers, not just one. You'll see a bunch of file type options. The most common for social media are JPEG and PNG. There are a lot of reasons you might choose one over the other, but a quick rule is if it's more cartoony, go with PNG, and if it's more like a photo or painting, choose JPEG. PNG can also have transparent backgrounds, while JPEG can't. This is just line art right now, so PNG is perfect. Choose a location on your hard drive to save the image, then click Save. Most of the export settings you can leave as default, but if you want, you can save it as a smaller size in the Output Size section here. Artists often work at a large original size, and then save it smaller to put it online. Click OK. Like I said, even though I've used the navigator to flip and rotate my canvas, what gets saved is the original image no matter what. And since I'm sure you're curious, what if you want to flip the actual image and not just the view? Those options can be found in the Edit menu under Rotate Flip Canvas. Now let's see how you can use layers to color line art. There are a few ways to do this, but I like to keep a separate layer for each color. I'll create a new layer, and name it Feathers. Click and drag the layer below the line art. I'll pick a color, then select the Fill tool. If you select the Refer Only to Editing Layer subtool, and click, the whole screen fills up. 
Instead, choose the Refer Other Layers subtool. By default, Refer Multiple is set to All Layers, but I like to set it to the Reference Layer option for more precision. Select your line art layer, and use this button to set it as the Reference Layer. Now, go back to the Feathers layer. Notice the special icon that now appears on my line art layer, indicating it's a reference layer. Go ahead and click a section of the line art to fill. It will attempt to fill between the lines of the reference layer as precisely as possible. If I zoom in and hide the line art, you can see the color has actually filled in underneath the lines a little, preventing those white outlines you sometimes see in art programs. If it's missing corners, or overfilling and crossing the lines, try adjusting the Close Gap and Area Scaling settings to your liking. Sometimes it just won't fill tight corners, though, and you'll need to go in with a pen tool and fill those manually. I'll continue to fill in the colors, making a new layer for each color. It's easy to end up with a whole bunch of layers this way, so to organize them, you can group them into layer folders. Click this button to create a folder. You can name it by double-clicking, just like with layers. I'll name this one Colors. You can click and drag each individual layer into the folder. Even easier, you can select multiple layers by clicking on the check mark next to them and drag them all into the folder at once. There's a lot more we can do, but I hope this has helped to get you started. Let's go ahead and save the image exactly as I showed you before. File, Export Single Layer, PNG. Select a location, click Save, then click OK. Now you've got a finished profile picture you can upload to your socials. Where do you go from here? I recommend taking some time to click through the various tools in CSP and try them out. I also have a bunch more tutorial videos on this channel, so don't forget to subscribe and check them out. If you do end up making a profile picture using this tutorial, please tag me at Miss Red Nebula on socials. I'd love to see it. Otherwise, bye for now. A big thank you to all of my patrons, with a special shout out to Novatier patron Joe C. Phipps. Check out my Patreon if you'd like to help support future content like this.